What's up everyone? Welcome to a Tidal Gardens Coral Spotlight. If you're new to this channel, Tidal Gardens is a coral farm located in Copley, Ohio, and on this channel we talk about all things coral reef aquarium related. One of the things that we like to do is a deep dive into a specific genus of coral, and that's what we're going to do here today with tracheophilia. Tracheophilia are commonly referred to as an open brain coral, and they are one of the most popular large polypstony corals amongst beginners and advanced reef hobbyists alike. Like with any coral, their naming convention can bounce around a bit as new information is uncovered. Let's briefly look at their taxonomy. For those of you who aren't into scientific lingo, taxonomy is the part of biological study that deals with the classification of organisms and explores the similarities and differences between them. It can be useful to know the taxonomy of your coral, as such information can provide insight into its needs based on its close relations that were similarly classified. Corals used to be grouped based on their visual features. Nowadays, with the developments in genetic sequencing, corals are grouped according to their genome and less so on their physical characteristics. Having said that, this is a cutting edge field and will likely be a work in progress for quite some time. The tricky thing is finding sequences of DNA that are actually diverse enough to show any differentiation whatsoever, because so much of the coral genome is pretty much identical from coral to coral. Now as more study is done, these corals can then be periodically reclassified. Tracheophilia are currently part of the Merulinidae family. These corals have had many names attributed to them over the years and have had their fair share of scientific reclassification. At different times, they have been called both tracheophilia as well as walsophilia. Moving on, tracheophilia are a large polypstony coral that is commonly referred to as an open brain coral. They are a free living coral, meaning that they are colonies with the ability to inflate their tissue and move around a little bit with the help of the water current. If they happen to find themselves in undesirable conditions, they can attempt to remedy the situation by moving themselves. Now, in an aquarium setting, this movement is pretty limited because even in high flow aquariums, it just simply does not compare with what you might see in the ocean. So tracheophilia are going to be pretty sedentary. Tracheophilia are normally a single large polyp. On occasion, you do find colonies that consist of one larger colony and then what appears to be essentially a daughter colony right next to it. This looks as though the coral may be budding, which is an asexual reproduction method, but that is probably not what is going on here. What is actually happening is during the coral spawning event, you will get a stray spawn landing and settling onto or right next to an existing colony. When they grow up, it looks like a double or triple headed trachea. For whatever reason, these smaller colonies are frequently seen from tracheophilia imported from the western coast of Australia. As for other geographies, the east coast of Australia has some of the most amazing and huge multicolored showpieces and Indonesia tends to have smaller colonies with equally impressive striking colors. There's a huge range in skeletal growth and you can generally tell from the appearance of a colony where it was collected. Tracheophilia are one of the most highly desired and prized corals amongst collectors of large polypstony corals, due in large part to their diverse coloration and the intensity of those colors. There are monochromatic green striped colonies, but there's also some absolutely show-stopping rainbow colored colonies that find their way into the hobby. These show grade colonies can have yellows, reds, orange, pink, green, pretty much the entire color of the rainbow. Although you don't hear as much about tracheophilia as say more popular corals such as scolemia or acanthophilia, I think that we can all agree that these corals are every bit as beautiful. Now that we've gone over some of the background info on tracheophilia, let's dive into their care requirements. Let's first cover the topic of nutrition, which I'll break into lighting and feeding. Open brains 
are photosynthetic corals, meaning that they get nutrients from the products of photosynthesis carried out by symbiotic dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae that are living in their flesh. Zooxanthellae utilize chlorophyll to absorb light and produce simple sugars that the coral can consume for energy. While some corals are more light-loving than others, tracheophilia tend to be less demanding in this regard. In fact, they probably fare better in less intense lighting conditions. We typically keep tracheophilia in low to medium light intensity here at Tidal Gardens, which is around 50 to 100 par. If your tank is in higher light, it will take some time for this coral to adjust to its new surroundings. When in doubt, try lower lighting intensities until it's really clear that the coral is stable before trying to ramp up that intensity. If you have a colony of trachophilia and want to experiment with higher light, remember that lighting that is too bright risks burning the coral, and this will happen very quickly. If you start to see the coral turn a lighter, more bleached out color, it's time to move it to a dimmer location. It is possible for a trachephilia that's been bleached to recover, but it can take a long time. It may also permanently change color having expelled all of the zooxanthellae of a certain type. What may help is to aggressively feed the coral during this time, which can act to stabilize the coral long enough that it can eventually repopulate with zooxanthellae. Since we brought that up, let's quickly cover the topic of direct feeding. In addition to photosynthesis, these corals are adept feeders that can grab and consume a wide variety of foods ranging from coral formulated sinking pellets to frozen foods such as brine shrimp, mysis, and even large pieces such as krill. Tracheophilia are up there with scolemia for putting on dramatic feeding displays. By day, they are a fluffy pillow of smooth, multicolored tissue. But as soon as they detect the faintest hint of food in the water, their feeding response is activated, turning them into an explosion of hungry tentacles. I've noticed that the more regularly fed a trachea is, the easier that they are to feed in the future. A well-fed trachea's tentacles are out more often, and the coral as a whole is more responsive to food in the water. It is tempting to dump lots of food on them, but it is also possible to overfeed. Most of the nutrition that tracheophilia needs will come from the lighting, and they will be absorbing other nutrients from their water directly. Now, the risk of overfeeding is that it can pollute the water, and that can be hard to remedy. If you're going to direct feed, aim to feed multiple times a week to allow the coral to also expel the waste that's produced. Target feeding LPS can be tricky with an aquarium full of hungry fish, as they will often steal it directly from the coral once you've fed it. The bigger concern that I have with feeding is that certain fish and inverts such as shrimp and crabs can cause major damage to a coral when they go after that food. I've literally lost entire heads of coral the day after a big feeding, and it's pretty clear that one of my cleanup crew just tore the polyps apart. Fish stealing food out of the coral's grasp is one thing, but if you have tank mates that are ripping corals apart to get at the food, something more drastic has to be done if you're insistent on feeding. There are a few different techniques to try to combat this. First, you can try just good old-fashioned distraction. When it's time to feed your corals, try adding a fresh strip of nori on the other end of the tank. Make sure all your fish are stuffed. If you keep the fish occupied, the coral should have time to digest its meal. If that isn't successful, another option is to use some sort of DIY feeding barrier. A good way to do this is to save an old pretzel container or something and use it to go over top of the coral at feeding time. And you can even go as far as drilling a hole in the top and installing a feeding tube so you can squirt the food directly into that space. There are plenty of DIY ideas online to solve this problem, and if you want to get even fancier, I'm sure that there's plans on the internet for 3D printed coral cages that would allow for this type of feeding. All right, let's move on to water flow. Trachephilia appreciates low to medium flow. There are two things that I'm looking to accomplish with flow. The first is to give it enough flow that it keeps it clean. 
Detritus buildup can cause the coral to die back where it's allowed to collect. Providing some elevated flow around the coral can prevent this accumulation. Even moderate flow can serve to keep the coral clean as the coral does a pretty decent job of sloughing off debris that settles on it. You'll know if you're giving the coral too much flow, if one of the sides of the coral looks like it's getting slammed and it's drawn super tight to the skeleton all the time. Long term, if this flow isn't adjusted, it can cause the coral to die back at that and peel essentially right off of its bones. Another argument for keeping the coral in lower flow is that it makes feeding a lot easier. Providing periodic low flow or, or even zero flow is beneficial for this coral when it comes time to feed because you really want to give it every opportunity to react to and grab and swallow that food. Okay, moving on. Let's talk a little bit about chemistry. As I mentioned previously, there are problems associated with overfeeding. So let's talk about how that manifests chemically, and that is phosphate and nitrate. Phosphate and nitrate are great general measurements of water cleanliness. They show up mainly in the food that we provide the tank, but pretty much any kind of decaying plant or animal matter that can also elevate these in the water. We generally shoot for about five to 10 parts per million nitrate, and 0.05 to 0.1 parts per million phosphate. If nitrate levels get too high, corals may react negatively by taking on a more drab coloration or if it's really bad, suddenly dying back. If phosphates are too high, it can be a little bit more subtle. Phosphates may feed into an unwanted algae bloom or spur on the growth of other undesirable organisms that can stifle the growth of corals. For a little while there, there was this push in the hobby to have near zero levels of nitrate and phosphate, or actual zero levels. This is done through techniques such as carbon dosing, or GFO, which can aggressively bring those numbers down. Ultra low nutrient levels though, come with their own sets of issues. There's definitely such a thing as too clean, and I would argue that the problems caused by near zero nutrient levels are much worse than those caused by an abundance of nitrate and phosphate. Corals require some level of nitrate and phosphate available in the water. When they're starved out, the corals first can take on this like sunken, emaciated look, especially LPS, and then they start dying back. After that, there is a risk for blooms of unwanted organisms such as brown dinoflagellates that, for some reason, thrive in these ultra-low nutrient conditions. For trachophilia specifically, I would much rather see nitrate and phosphate levels on the high side than barely detectable or zero because honestly we've kept them in systems with very high nutrient with little to no difficulties. Moving on from those nutrient parameters, let's take a look at the building block parameters calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Real quick here. So because trachophilia are stony corals, these are the three major chemical parameters that are needed by the coral to build its skeleton. Starting first with calcium, it is a major ion in salt water. In the ocean, its level hovers right around 425 parts per million. As a coral grows, calcium is absorbed from the water and used to form that calcium carbonate skeleton. Alkalinity is a collection of ions that generally equate to carbonate availability in the water. Technically, it is the amount of acid required to lower the pH of salt water to the point that bicarbonate turns into carbonic acid. If you have more alkalinity, it can soak up more acid. If you have less alkalinity, you have less buffering capacity, making the tank a little bit more susceptible to chemical changes. Alkalinity tends to be the parameter that fluctuates the most. So if you're only testing one thing frequently, test alkalinity. In natural seawater, the alkalinity of the water typically measures around 7 to 8 dKH, although most salt mixes these days mix up closer to 8 or 9 dKH, sometimes even higher than that. The reason for this is that some aquarists like to overload this parameter a little and keep their tanks at around that 10 to 11 dKH, under the belief that having elevated calcium and alkalinity in the water 
can contribute to faster stony coral growth. The last point that I'll make about water chemistry is that stability is the ultimate goal. Even if the parameters are off a little bit, it's better for them to remain consistent at that level rather than having like the hobbyist hurriedly try to change these values, trying to hit a very specific target. Here is where keeping an eye on magnesium can help a little bit. Raising calcium and alkalinity can be tricky because of how they interact. Calcium ions and carbonate, they want to react with one another. Addition of a calcium supplement can often come with a corresponding fall in alkalinity levels, and vice versa. If you're experiencing this in your system, it's normal, but you really want to avoid those wild swings. Again, it's all about stability. But like I said, if you're experiencing these dramatic swings of calcium and alkalinity, you may want to take a look at your magnesium levels. In short, magnesium acts to increase the overall bioavailability of alkalinity compounds in the water. In the ocean, magnesium sits at around 1350 parts per million. Okay, that should give you a little bit of background on the chemical parameters to keep an eye on. Trichophilia are a somewhat slow growing large polyp stony. Their fleshy portion grows quickly, but not so much that actual skeleton. Still, as they grow, and you also add more stony coral tank mates, it's wise to test more frequently to make sure that your chemistry is keeping up. Shifting gears a little bit, how about aquaculture? Now that we can take care of trachophilia, can we breed them or frag them? The simple answer is not really. Trachies are an extremely slow grower, at least when you're talking about commercial aquaculture. And if you cut them, it may take many years to recover that desirable shape. One future solution may be sexual reproduction, especially considering the advances in the area happening right now. But the resources required for such a project and the amount of space that's going to be required for this and the timetable might not make this commercially viable. We will see. Sexual breeding could result in some really interesting hybrids and color morphs, which could be a very interesting development for the industry. Is it going to be worth it? Only time will tell. Regardless, I think it's something good to pursue, and hopefully, in time, this whole genus can be offered in a much more sustainable fashion. The last topic that we'll cover is pests. Luckily, trachophilia don't usually struggle with them but there are a couple that are worth keeping an eye on. The first are gall crabs of the genus Cryptochiridae. They're a family of crabs that burrow into coral skeletons and then form these abnormal growths called galls. Most of the male gall crabs are free living, but it's these pesky females that are the ones causing the abnormal growths. It is thought that the crabs feed on the mucus produced by the coral, as well as detritus, Gall crabs are considered pests because if they're present, they can really stifle the growth of trachophilia. These crabs are easily removed, so it's worth inspecting your colony when you pick one of these corals up. The other pests that's worth mentioning are flatworms, and these can plague LPS generally rather than trachophilia specifically. What's good is that a quick dip normally remedies the problem, and especially if they're caught early enough, that's obviously better. If you have a lot of these flatworms though, you may have to do a full tank treatment. The problem with doing full tank treatments, however, is that oftentimes these flatworms, in the process of dying, will release toxins that can be very deadly for the other tank inhabitants, especially fish. So if you're going to do a full tank treatment, be ready to aggressively change the water in the tank and aggressively carbon filter everything. Even then, I have noticed that the large polyp stony coral flatworms tend to be a lot more resilient than just the annoying looking rust-colored ones to stick to the glass. So it might take several efforts. Luckily, these types of flatworms are not as deadly as Acropora-eating flatworms or anything like that. They are a pest, but I would say that they're more unsightly rather than deadly. Okay, that pretty much does it for trachophilia. So what kind of tank is trachophilia best suited for? I see them as a showpiece large polyp stony, perhaps in a mixed reef, and they can introduce an amazing burst of color to the lower section of that reef. 
the rainbow paint splatter varieties in particular can hold their own as a signature showpiece on par with much more expensive corals, such as scolemia or acanthophilia. Hopefully this video is helpful for those looking to try them for the first time. If you'd like some more information or perhaps purchase tracheophilia for your home aquarium, I invite you to visit us at tidalgardens.com and see what we have. We're always on the lookout for new and interesting color morphs of this coral to add to our collection, and hopefully yours as well. Until next time, happy reefing.